Hi there, this is Carl Irwin with a follow-up to uh, Guess the Method uh, trick involving this uh, uh, any card at original number sort of plot. Uh, as I look through the comments as of the time that I'm making this um, follow-up here, a few of you got all of it exactly the way it is. So I'd say about four or five people uh, were able to kind of dissect what was going on there. How many times you watched it in order to get that, I don't know. Um, but of course the real... Um, the real test is to watch it one time and, and see if you can sort out the, the basics of what's happening there. I kind of laugh, uh, and I, I picked on a couple of you there for pointing out a false shuffle. Well, you know, duh, there's no, <laughs> no magicians can see a false shuffle a mile away. I mean, a, a, a Heinstein shuffle looks like a Heinstein shuffle. A zero shuffle looks like a zero shuffle. Or you could be Richard Turner uh, doing a, a push-through shuffle. And uh, anyone who knows what a, a push-through or a pull-out shuffle looks like and how they work will see it. It doesn't really matter. The one that I did was very, you know, uh, one person said it's hard to, hard to get away with uh, given the angle and the burnable nature of this, that the camera doesn't move and you're looking right at it. And that's, that's true. And uh, again, I say that for all false shuffles. The one I did was was essentially a piece of, Leonard Green shuffle, his real green one, uh, where you fake you fake the riffle entirely, right, at an odd angle. So from here you can see it perfect. From the camera perspective, uh, I maintain that if you didn't know about false shuffles, you probably that would go by you and you wouldn't think twice about it. But you fake it, and then uh, you the way I do it is I just I just riffle in one pack on top of the other. Um, the, the the green one, Leonard Green, would, would riffle both sides, but he would do it right out in the open so that you're looking at, uh, if you look out there at the front in the mirror, you would, you'd be seeing this arch from both hands. Um, I find that that's not terribly beneficial or not necessary, I guess, especially if you're sitting at a table uh, and you can turn and get an angle. Or if you're doing it in the hands, you could actually do this in the hands, and I find that you can do a false uh, riffle. Uh, that's fairly well covered. If again, if you look in the mirror, right from from an, uh, an odd angle, and then go right into the uh, uh, riffle from one hand, I find that you can do that um, moving around uh, off of the table, and it's not noticed. Um, my favorite in the hands false riffle shuffle is actually a Heinstein one, but uh, I just did. Like I said, I'm I'm doing this. You know, the Heinstein shuffle. Just I, I haven't taught the Heinstein shuffle mostly because it's kind of in print. Right, still, I think it's still uh, you're still able to buy that, but I'll, I will share my variation on it. My variation on the Heinstein is to uh, do a riffle and then steal off the top card. Carl Hein doesn't teach that um, part of it, and then I do the the, the shuffle uh, as as he teaches, it, just like that. So I so you get one shuffle on it rather than having to do two in sequence um, or having to do a cut. Because there's another variation where you can do a cut at the end. Uh, st you could slip cut a card off like this, right, and set down, and then and then go forward with it. Or you could do a cut like you do for a zero shuffle. Uh, or you could uh, do do the one that I'm talking about, where you steal one uh, in the natural motion of what it looks like to uh, riffle the cards down, and then uh, and then split the pack. So you do a you do a steal, right? Uh, a slip, a slip cut rather, and then you follow up with the the uh, regular riff from the one side. So, um, essentially, what I did on the video is the same thing without the cover card. You know, you're just taking one pack off, faking it. There's, this is a fake riffle, and then you just put together. Not really worth going over, but that's what I did. Okay. So, yeah, obviously, there's a false shuffle, and uh, you know, again. Uh, I don't think you'll ever find a video where someone, you know, a presentation, live or in video, where, where a magician does a false shuffle, and as someone who knows about false shuffles, you won't know about it. You'll see it there, um, just by the nature of the fact that they look false. You know, they look false compared to the real thing. If you know the real thing, and you know the false thing, you're going to see them. Um, so... I debated whether or not I would bother with that, and I thought, yeah, I'll put it in there and, and just let it go, because it makes no difference, really. If if I just left the deck alone inside the box, there's always an assumption that there's some kind of stack. So whenever you're watching a, uh, a trick that has uh, a deck that is not 
shuffled in some way in the moment, you should presume a stack. And then when you watch it shuffled by the magician, if it's obviously clearly a false shuffle, as all false shuffles are obvious to someone who knows about them, uh, then you have that verified. So I figured I'd throw that at you. Um, uh, and the other thing I did, I also gave you another benefit. I chose to use a card that was deep in the deck. So I went for the Queen of Spades uh, so that you would have the benefit of seeing all of the cards dealt out and being able to dissect what was going on there. And by seeing all the cards dealt out, you, you should, if you've figured out the basic premise, at least by a second viewing, would be able to verify your, your presumptions uh, in watching where those cards are placed at. So, the solution to this, yes, it is a, it is a stack. There is one level of equivocate, just one. Um, certainly you could have more than that and do this uh, a little bit more directly, even with one card, and we're, we'll actually talk about that later. Um, but there is uh, 12 possible cards because all of the picture cards uh, are set up in a multiple out scenario, and that's what uh, a few of you uh, were able to figure out, uh, that, that is, that's what's going on here. So, But I think the downside to showing this uh, to, to even lay people is that it's not a choice of card and number that they're choosing the card and really you are implying the number. That, that lack of, a, of a, a second piece of information being provided by the spectator um, points to a setup. Right, it makes it too perfect, given the fact that the cards aren't shuffled and aren't changed. Whereas in any card at any number, for example, kind of trick where the cards are never out of the the deck, ever never out of the pack, they they remain in place in the deck uh, as they were put into the box. Um, in that situation, you have a card and a number given by the spectator. Uh, so that makes the fact that the cards are stuck in the box completely irrelevant um, because the new issue is how do you put together those two pieces of information. This presentation doesn't have that benefit, so it's probably a good idea if you, if you do try this, and, I, and I'm asking you to try it. Go ahead, and, go ahead and put this together this way, either as a setup or there's an impromptu version we'll look at that I'd have you try too. Uh, that's really all equivoque, and we'll talk about equivoque again in a little bit. But try this out uh, by doing a false shuffle, any false shuffle that you want. Uh, but anyway, that's it. Let's talk uh, briefly about what the setup is, uh, and and then I'll talk about some variations on this. And we're going to deal with equivoque and multiple outs uh, together, which is a very powerful combination to have both of those things in play. And what that does for you is it allows you to use some equivoque, but it also allows you to have some true questions that have true chance answers to them. Uh, and that's dealt with by the multiple outs. It allows you to narrow down to a smaller number of multiple outs so that you don't have to have 52, right? Um, uh, there are some tricks that have 52 multiple outs. Um, uh, this doesn't have to be one of them. So we're going to get this narrowed down to 12 cards. Uh, you could narrow it down to four cards. You could do this really, again, equivocate down to one card. That's a little risky. You'd want to do that in certain kinds of company. But let's take a look at the stack for a 12-card multiple out. Okay, so this is a 12-card stack. Uh, and essentially what's going on here, uh, some of you were able to identify this uh, right on the video. Get the card box out of the way here. Uh, move this out. Some of you were able to figure this out uh, from the, um, pro again, probably from multiple viewings, probably at least from a second viewing once you understood what's going on. As I counted through the cards, I gave you the benefit of being able to see most of the deck all the way down to the Queen of Spades, which is the one that I decided to use as my presentation. Um, and that should allow you to see all these other cards that are actually in position in regular 13 card intervals. Uh, so the multiple out here is that is this idea of new deck order. Most people don't know what new deck order is. Even people that play, play with cards a lot and have opened up new decks don't necessarily remember what is the exact new deck order. Um, you have a couple of jokers usually that sit one of a couple ways, one on top, one on the bottom, or you'll have both jokers on the bottom with the um, uh, advertising card 
and the there's usually two advertising cards, like a rule card, and then an adver- there's four spare cards in the deck. So the two jokers plus two extra cards uh, that are in there as well. And uh, usually they're at one side of it, or they could be divided up on either side of the deck. Uh, however, the cards in the middle, uh, in new deck order, true new deck order, are spades. Uh, sorry, spades on the bottom, which are ace through king, followed by diamonds, which are ace through king. And then in the center, there's two kings together because the um, sequence reverses with the clubs, which would be king through ace. And then on the top is the hearts, king through ace. So I use this uh, one option for my queens. And I decided to use the queen so that at least I wouldn't tip off that. Because once I start giving you some other variation of new deck order, uh, you guys are going to see right through that. So I decided to use at least the queens to give you a little bit of a run for your money and try to figure this out. But I did allow you to see the whole deck so that you could um, try to try to sort out this stack. Okay, so I have my queen set exactly that way. So I have my queen of spades is the 12th card in from the bottom, just where it would be in new deck order. I do the same thing for the queen of diamonds, and then you see here up here the queen of hearts uh, would be in that 13 card stack of clubs uh, in the 12th position in the sequence that it should be. Uh, if this were true new deck order, and then the same for the Queen of Hearts. So that's one out, is that the Queens are in place. And as I count through, you would notice right when I get to 12, you see the Queen of Hearts, after I just got done telling you where, um, you know, the, the suit that would be at the top and the sequence they would be in. That's verified once you see that Queen, if you're looking for it. And that's a little bit of a subtlety there that I gave you on the... Um, video, I do try to lead you a little bit by saying we're looking for the Queen of Spades because I really don't want you to pay attention to anything else as magicians who are in the know as you're watching this. Now, other people, they're not going to catch this at all. This is going to be fly right over their head. They won't notice at all. To them, everything is out of order except for that one card that we're looking for. Okay. Uh, now, the other outs. Uh, what I did for the Kings was very similar, but I changed up what the pattern would be. I would call new deck order um, in uh, as being spades, hearts, clubs, and diamonds, ace through king for all of them. What that really is, is that's the order of suits, and a card player would know that, so it would fly pretty easily for someone who plays cards. Most people don't play cards anymore. Uh, it's not a terribly popular thing. It's got kind of a, a niche following uh, in um, Texas Hold'em, and in Texas Hold'em, I don't believe that the suits matter. Uh, you don't really have a suit hierarchy, but there is a suit hierarchy that is traditional to cards, and that is spades, hearts, clubs, diamonds, spades being the highest, diamonds being the lowest. So um, what we're doing is we're following that order. So it sounds logical to people. And the ace of spades would be on the top, uh, which also sounds plausible. So if you notice here, I have a king, king of spades in the 13th position here. And then in the next one, the next time we get through the 13 cards, it's the hearts. And the next time we go through the 13 card sequence, I have the king of clubs. And of course, the king of diamonds is on the end. And one of the reasons why I did the um, false shuffle there, and I decided to do it as well, is I didn't want you to see the King of Diamonds on the bottom at the beginning when I showed the cards. Uh, I wanted it to be some other card and then do a shuffle and then do a cut. Um, obviously, at the break that's created from the shuffle, it creates a big you know, gap in there. Um, and then you can just cut to it. Uh, I wanted to be able to switch it at the end so that when I show the cards at the end, it was a different card, hopefully to give you a little bit of a red herring. So uh, that's the Kings. Now, the, the last multiple out, and this is, the, this is the real stretch, but again, people who aren't really in the know won't, won't pick up on this at all. Jacks are set up in this order um, from top to bottom. I guess we'll go from here. Diamonds... Uh, followed by spades, followed by uh, cl uh, hearts, followed by clubs. This is chased order, right, from bottom to top. So clubs, hearts, uh, spades, and diamonds. And for the pattern, I would say to the spectators, and they are in chased order. Uh, magicians call this chased order because it goes from clubs to hearts, 
uh, to uh, spades to diamonds, right? So chaste. Uh, and magicians know that. And that's a very common order for suits. Uh, and that is new deck order uh, from the face to the top. And I say from the face to the top, saying that the ace of diamonds would be on the bottom. So if, if you had that and you ran into people that would be in the know, um, they would catch on to that. Now, the other, the one benefit you have going for you is that um, new deck order is not standard. Uh, it's standard per company, but it is not standard across companies. That various companies actually do have different new deck order setups. Uh, European uh, uh, setups, I believe, typically go ace king, ace king, ace king, ace king. So everything's in the same order. Whereas the United States playing card company in the United States, where where we, you know, our decks are made here in inside the country. Uh, they go for the new deck order that I explained at the very beginning. So there are some variations there, and you may have the ability to, you know, pull a pull a bit of a fib there if you get called out and say, "Well, this is the, you know, this is the European." Uh, new deck order, or you know, you could name some other company. You could make a company up if you wanted to, um, but there's, you know, there's a way. There's a way to justify it. Um, but anyway, that's it for twelve cards. So it's a simple matter of of doing this um, uh, equivoque, where you say there's all these cards in the box, uh, and I'll ask you to remove, you know, figuratively, imaginatively, remove either the number cards or the picture cards. It doesn't matter what they say. If they say remove the picture cards, you say, okay, let's remove those out, and we're looking at them. If they say remove the number cards, you say, okay, we'll remove those from the from the box, and we are left with the picture cards. Now imagine that you're able to look at these picture cards, and that's the only level of equivocate. It's a pretty good one, too, because it's not really that traceable, and it's followed up with uh, the next two questions are legit. So the next question would be uh, to have them pick a value, and you can say, you know, you have jack, queen, king, so go ahead and pick a value. And when they pick the value, it's a value that you use, right? And then you can say, uh, one level, I don't think I did this on the video, but a, a, nice, a nice little gag here is on the um, uh, uh, suits at the very end, when you ask them to pick a suit, you can say, go ahead and pick a suit, and, it, and just like the other two choices, whatever you pick will be what we use. Okay, uh, and the the lie in there is that the last choice is true, but the first choice may not be true. But it doesn't have to be true, right? It just has to be. It just has to make sense in the moment. It just has to be plausible in the moment. So uh, you say, you know, pick a suit. Whatever suit you choose is the one we go with. And then you can do it from there. Um, just have them count into it. You have to explain uh, from there. You go into your multiple out. So depending on what they chose, if they chose kings, you have to explain the new deck order for kings. Uh, and you go through the cards. 1 through 13 would be the spades, uh, ace through king. Uh, the next set would be the hearts, which would be uh, 14 through 20. And then the next one would be the uh, clubs, which would be uh, 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 14, I'm sorry, would be uh, 27 through 39, and then 40 through 52 through the, uh, for the last one. So it also helps, I think, as you're going through this to kind of trip up a little bit on it and, and not be extremely not sound extremely prepared in your response. So try to go through the math, count with fingers to say, so that would put the card at, okay, whatever. Uh, make sure you, you know, present it in that way so that they can reason through it as you're reasoning through it and then they go through. And again, the um, uh, subtlety that I gave, uh, we are looking for this card. So make sure you're on the lookout for that. So as, they, as you deal through or as they deal through, they're looking for that card uh, to find it. Um, you know, if you get the Jack of Diamonds uh, and you go for the Jacks, that's a nice easy one, right? One, two, so the next card should be the one you have, right, if we're doing that. You might, for the Jacks, want to count from the faces to make it a little bit more logical, right? If you're counting Ace through King, you might count from here and have them, you know, do it that way. Uh, they can just set them out and reverse the order as they go through, and then it gives you a way to think about it logically as you're going down to the jacks. So you could count it from that side uh, to make more sense of it. And also think of the numbers from the face up. Maybe even explain new deck order from the face up. Okay, uh, so that's it. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, other options for this kind of a presentation or this sort of plot. Uh, and I'll give you a little bit of the history that I was thinking about when I came up with this.
Okay, so very briefly, the history that I was uh, behind this little idea here, I was trying to figure out a way to straight up equivocate uh, the card and the number for an Akon, for an any card at any number. You know, a way to just to just you know force through 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 words. Um, through questions and choices, a way for someone to get there. And that seems implausible, and it seems probably impossible for those of you who've dealt with equivocate, but it isn't necessarily impossible. Um, and it's not really all that, you know, it's, it, it's plausible. You can do it. Um, the number side was the part that was tricky because it's not it's not very easy to split down numbers into categories by half with each question and that's really what you want to do you want to eliminate a large chunk you know half of what you're working with with each question and that that one issue alone made the number side very difficult and then i got to thinking about this idea of new deck order what if i was going to try equivocate on the card side of it but I just force the concept of new deck order on the spectator to give me my number, right? It's kind of like a half of an Akon performance, right? And that, that in itself would be pretty interesting if all the cards are out of order except for one card that was in, you know, new deck order. Uh, and then that got me thinking about ideas for this. So that's, that's where I came from. Now, equivocate for one card. Um, first of all, let's deal with equivocate for uh, less than 12. Uh, some of you brought up the idea that maybe I was just using queens. Uh, and if you were listening to my questions, you shouldn't have come to that conclusion because my uh, choices on there were authentic, except for the very first one. So the first one would tip you off to equivocate about picture cards and number cards. But the ones that followed that were, were totally fair, uh, and I went with whatever was given, um, unless you thought that I was giving you the best case scenario. So might have, some of you might have thought that I was doing that. Uh, I wasn't. Um, I was, you know, being honest about those questions uh, in my presentation there. But you could uh, do an equivoque uh, series that leaves the last choice being legit. So you could do this. You could say. Um, which, which do you want to remove from the box? The number cards or the picture cards? And they say what they want, and then you focus on the picture cards, whether they took them out or whether they left them in. The next one would be uh, to get down to the queens, which is the best case scenario for equivocate, because you can segregate by gender, uh, which is the ladies and the men. Uh, you can say, now you're looking at the picture cards, you have ladies, you've got men there. Uh, so uh, which ones do you want to take out? The ladies or the men? Uh, so take out, right? And you can kind of do this image here. You know, impulsively, which one do you want to take out, the ladies or the men? And uh, they would say whatever they say, the men. You say, great, you took out the men, so now you're looking at the ladies. The other one is, okay, you take out the ladies, and uh, and that, that uh, you know, leaves us with those ladies, right? A better one is actually this. Which one do you want to give to me? Okay, so the ladies are the men, and they can say, they'll give you the men, say, great, I'll take the men, that leaves you with the ladies, you're looking at the ladies. If they say the ladies, say, great, I'll take the ladies, now I'm holding them up in front of you, and you can see that I've got these four suits, um, you know, so pick one. So that, that kind of approach to equivocate can get you in two levels down to one legitimate choice about suit, and you can just put the queens in there and uh, pull it off. So if you're comfortable with equivocate, you could do that. Um, Again, I think that's unnecessary. If you're going to be setting up a deck, you might as well do all 12. Uh, but if you don't want to go through the hassle of explaining new deck order in two different ways, you could just do it that way. Um, additionally, you could add another layer in there and get you down to two choices if you add the red-black scenario, right? So you could start rather than with um, uh, picture cards and number cards, say there's red cards in there, there's black cards in there, we're going to cut this in half. So which ones would you like to remove, figuratively remove from the box, the red or the black? So that gets you down to uh, the black, let's say the black is what you go with, uh, which would be the clubs, which is in the second pile, and in the second set of 13, the spades, which is in the third, uh, the fourth one, which gives you a lot of dealing and makes it, you know, interesting. Uh, so you could do that. 
Uh, and then you go from there to the picture cards, number cards, and then you go from there to uh, the uh, ladies and men, and then you go from there to a legit question about clubs or spades. So you still end up with a totally legit question at the very end with levels of equivocation. Some of you inevitably are hearing me explain this saying that would never work. Yeah, it works. Okay, it works very well. I'll explain why in a moment when I talk about equivocate specifically. Lastly, you could... Um, you could deal with a single card equivoque session, right? Where you get it down to one. Uh, I have found that the Queen of Spades is the best one. So the one I showed you actually would be, I think, in my opinion, probably the better way to go. Um, but it's just a matter of letting, of of, in, of inserting one more layer to get uh, spades and clubs out. Okay. And I say, I say that because people are more likely to sp pick spades and clubs, so you can end a little bit more cleanly on the last part when they pick the, um, uh, the suit and not having to uh, eliminate the opposite of what they picked because uh, they're more likely to pick spades. Uh, there's also some things you can say. I played around with at the onset of this little project. I played around with the pattern. Uh, that I would have. And I had a nice long pattern, particularly with this equivocate thing, um, where I was going to try to force one card, where I would explain cards that people choose, right? You know, usually whenever you you ask someone to think of a card, they think of um, they think of the ace of spades first, right? There's a large chunk of people, like 20%. That's not true. It's actually less than that. Uh, there's uh, you know a, a slightly smaller group that think of the queen of hearts, right? There's a slightly smaller group that think of one of the red aces, either the ace of hearts or the ace of diamonds, and then a slightly smaller group that thinks of the king of hearts, which would be next. Then a smaller group yet, which thinks of the seven of clubs. So I've got I don't know why the seven of clubs, but that's one that they think of, right? So I've got five cards right there and as a magician I can use that information that that um, that uh, statistic to my advantage and I could have something preset but instead I want you to think more methodically about a card so rather than just think of a card I'm going to methodically and procedurally get you to uh, think of a card that even you wouldn't think of right now and that justifies my questions right so you can do that setup uh, and then go through your equivoque questions and say, look, all of this is fair. And of course, as is true in equivoque, you can always give them a choice to change their mind once you lock them in. So you can have them changing their mind as much as you want and then locking them in and then going on to the next one. You get down to the queen of spades and then you can, you know, force that on them. If you do one card, um, you could do it impromptu because you could just cut to a few cards above the Queen of Spades and then call it in to the 12th position from the bottom. And then and then you're in legit new deck order location. So uh, you could do this fairly impromptu by doing a quick set uh, of the Queen of Spades before you enter into the um, sort of the start of the trick. Uh, and in doing so, the deck could have been shuffled by somebody else. Right, and a little bit of time delay in there. You could you could do that. That is possible. Um, likewise, if you want to set your equivocate to do something that's close to the top, you could very easily do that by um, uh, showing that the cards are all mixed up, doing your call, and then inserting at a top location as you close up your spread. So that's another option that you could you know play around with and see if you can get that to work. Uh, so anyway, yeah, try this. Try this with equivoque, all equivoque, only equivoque, and one card, and see see if you can do that for anyone. Let's talk a little bit about equivoque now, uh, because that's really what this tutorial is about, is, is about the concept of equivoque. I talked about how equivoque and multiple outs is, is a superior route, but let's talk about just the, the one side, the magician's choice, equivoque, and seeing how that can work. Uh, with with a deck of cards. Okay, so a, a, a discussion on equivoque. This is probably the best part of this little follow-up here, is this little discussion here. Um, there are a number of really good sources that deal with equivoque. Uh, uh, David Berglas wrote some on equivoque. That's very useful. Uh, he has uh, kind of a 
some bullet points of things that you should keep in mind. Uh, I'm not going to go over all of those things. You can research those yourself, but I'll mention some of the ones that stick out in my mind. Um, Max Maven had a really good uh, series uh, video on uh, equivocate that came out a number of years ago. And essentially in the video, I think it's called um, Multiplicity. Uh, if you can find that, I, th I think it's still out there. Uh, you can still purchase that. Um, essentially in that, in that video, what he does is he explains the concept and then he shows you like 20 tricks that are the same trick, right? And it shows you all the possible ways that you can deal with a spectator trying to get them down to a choice. And in some cases it's five choices, in some cases it's ten choices, in some cases it's three choices, but it's really all the same thing. Uh, and he gives you a few pointers on that. And uh, I'm going to discuss some of these things that I've picked up from those sources that I've seen before and some things that I found on my own and just, you know, my own experience. So first of all in equivocate, there's a wrong way to do it. The wrong way to do it goes like this. I have three cards. Um, go ahead and pick one, right? And they say this one. And then you say, okay, we'll get rid of that. That's the wrong way to do that, okay? That is not, that's not the right way because it's illogical. When someone picks something specifically, you don't take it away, right? You don't do that. Um, you want to change your words. You need to use better words. You shouldn't say pick one. Right, you you should say point to two, right, or point to one, or even better, go ahead and push one towards me, or or can you can you drag one away, right? You want to, you want to use geographic terms that are making people move things rather than selecting them, or you say pick one up. Okay, that's better. Don't say pick one. Avoid select, avoid pick, avoid those kinds of things. Those words, those words will will hurt your the impression that you're trying to give if you have to eliminate. Okay, so that's the first tip that I've heard many people say. Uh, make sure that you're using geographic uh, movement rather than picking and selecting. Now, how does this play into thinking of a card? Well, it's a simple matter of applying geographic movement to um, thinking of a card. So rather than say, think of, or name a suit, or name, uh, uh, you know, odds or evens, you know, or name picture cards or numbers, right? pick one of those. Instead of saying that, say, we're going to remove this from the box. We're going to set these over here. I want you to give to me the reds or the blacks. Which ones do you want to give to me, the red or the black? What I'm doing is I'm imagining the same geographic movement. Okay, This is something that has a lot more flexibility. Now, I'm, I'm not giving away the terms when I say, which would you like to give to me, right? Which would you like to remove from the box? Which would you like to take out of the fan, right? When I say that, as then I give the movement to it, that does not imply any sort of elimination. It doesn't. It doesn't imply it at all. Um, it it just re it just implies geographic movement of items. So in your equivocate, when you're doing this thought of you know, trying to think of a card, try to import geographic movement to to that, okay? So uh, that's the first tip. The second tip is um, be immediate and say it only once. Don't repeat yourself. And I actually have a hard time with that one. When I do equivocate, I have to catch myself often not, you know, I, I want to repeat what I said. And you don't want to do that. You want to say it one time and be direct with it. Uh, and, and try to be urgent and immediate about it. Um, so that's another thing. Because the moment you repeat yourself, uh, you give the spectator some time to think a little bit more about what's going on. So don't repeat yourself. Um, and, uh, you know, those are the two big ones. Those are the two real big things. Deal with geographic motion. Be direct and don't repeat yourself. Um, the third one, though, there's one last tip. I think it's very important, and this comes from Max Maven. 
um, he he would always say, uh, don't have a preferred option, right? So if I'm doing this, and I'm saying, you know, slide one card towards me, or could you could you pick up one of these cards, you know? Pick up one card. Uh, again, I just repeated it. You wouldn't want to do that. You'd say, um, pick up one card, think very quickly, be impulsive, right? That's really what you want to do. You don't want to do this when they pick it up. You don't want to think in your mind, shoot, that's not the one I wanted them to do. Now I have to go to plan B. In your mind, you should be thinking, perfect. That's exactly how this is supposed to go, right? So a little tip tip from Max Maven, you want to practice in such a way that whatever whatever they choose to do is perfect. It's exactly what you wanted. It is exactly how this was supposed to go. They are right where you want them to be, right? And you need to have that little inner monologue going on because if you don't think that way, it will show, right? You will start to sound like you're moving on to plan B. So you want to practice all of your options too when you come up with a routine that involves equivocate. Practice through all of them and be very, you know, quick about responding. Um, uh, uh, and uh, one other tip he mentions about that, I remember, uh, and I've heard this from other people too, is to be quick about giving the second, the second, the, the follow-up, um, the follow-up prompt, I guess is what it would be. So when when you say slide one slide one away, if it's if it's one that can be eliminated, right, or whatever, if it's not if it's not the one, because if you say slide one away and it's the one, you're done. That's it. But if it's not the one, say slide one away. You want to follow up quickly with, could you slide another one? And the reason is, as as right away as they start sliding the one that's no good, uh, you want to say slide another one. It's as if you gave them one motion. It's kind of like saying pick two, but really in the initial, in the beginning, you really only wanted them to pick one. Okay, um, and when if you say pick one and it's not the one, you'd want them to pick another one. So you can either eliminate two and end up with one, or you can get it down to the two that you want to deal with. So be very quick on the follow up. At, before they even complete the first prompt, once you know what they're doing, quickly add the second one to it so it looks like one. Uh, and that takes a little bit of practice. So um, that can be helpful. Um, how does this look with uh, equivoque that's imaginative when you're dealing with a full deck of 52? I don't know really what that one looks like other than to say that you want to follow up with your directive. So if you say um, remove... Uh, let's let's imagine that we're going to remove the blacks or the reds from the box. Which one do you want, black or red, right? Uh, which one do you want to remove, black or red? As soon as they say black, say, great, let's take a look at those black cards. You want to follow up immediately, say, great, that leaves us the red cards in the box that we're going to work with. So let's so imagine about, you know, what's what those are. Be very quick to move on to the next step. Um, don't don't sit there and, and tally your situation and try to figure out where you have to go next. Just know where to go and then get right on to it. So, so a few things on Equivoque. Uh, Equivoque, I think, is very useful. Try it out. Um, you know, the holidays are coming up. You'll be around some family. Uh, you know, take a box of 52 cards, put one card in one spot, uh, and try this out. You know, come up with some other kind of rationale to get to that number and see if you can force a single card. Find ways to divide in the quickest, you know, the, the fewest number of questions to get down to that choice or to a few choices and have a multiple out. Uh, but experiment with this and, and try it on people and see how well it works. You might be quite surprised at how, uh, how authentically this comes across and how impossible the outcome uh, seems to be to people. So anyway, thanks for playing along. Thank, thank you for all of your uh, comments on the initial uh, video there. If you have any comments on Equivoque or any thoughts or ideas uh, or Equivoque and multiple outs or multiple outs or any other kinds of ways that you might structure this uh, particular little effect here that I've uh, uh, shared with you, go ahead and put those in the comment section so we can share with everybody and uh, go ahead and do this. Get out and, and do this, one of these variations and, and see See, see what you think, see what you can make of it. So good luck with this and happy magicking.